Noster, quies in cielis, sanctificatitar nomen tum, adveniat regnum tum, fiat voluntas tua sicut in cielo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidiam da nobis hudi, et demit nobis debita nostra sicut et nos dominotos debitoribus nos, nostris, et ne nos inductos in tenanium sed libera nos a malo. Amen. So you probably don't know what I said. I, as you could tell by my pronunciation, I don't know what I'm saying either, barely. Uh, but what you just heard in a butchered form, I'm sure, is the Lord's Prayer in Latin. And uh, had you lived during many of several hundred years in the church, that is how you would have experienced the whole worship service in Latin, even though for most of that time, most of the church, most of the people in the church didn't actually speak Latin. The history of that is that uh, a few hundred years after uh, Christ lived, Latin became the official language of the church. And that became true because the Roman Empire adopted Christianity as their official religion, which is kind of an interesting fact because a few hundred years earlier, we know the story of the cross, right? The Romans crucified Jesus, they persecuted the church, but somehow, I guess through the work of the Spirit, it just kept growing and growing and thriving even when persecuted. It grew so big and, and so influential that it started converting people in Rome until the emperor himself was converted. And in uh, somewhere around the year 300, 400, they adopted uh, Christianity as the official language, uh, or I should say as the official religion of the Roman Empire. But one thing that happened when that happened was not only did things that were Christian become seen as part of Roman culture, but it's also true that the reverse was true. Things that were part of Roman culture became seen as fundamentally Christian. So for instance, the language of that empire, Latin, became the language of the church. And what's interesting is that stuck so powerfully in people's minds that even after people started speaking different languages in these lands, and even after almost nobody spoke Latin and it was a dead language, the church stuck to it because it pretty much saw Latin as the literal language of God, even though Jesus never spoke it. But that was kind of the mentality. So hundreds of years later, one of the central reforms of Luther wasn't just an idea about faith, but it was the idea that God actually wants us to understand the message of Christ, that God actually wants us to understand and participate what's, with what's happening in worship. Just like last week, we had the Pentecost story, it was Pentecost Sunday, uh, where the first miracle after Jesus is for God to make people able to understand the gospel in their own language, right? So Luther took the cue from God and said people should be able to understand what's happening, and they started doing worship, in his case in German, but basically in the language that was actually spoken, which was a huge reform. So even though today we speak our, uh, we, we worship in our own language, which is good, it's a huge improvement, and it's nice to know what's going on, I think it's still true that sometimes in worship it's hard to understand what's going on uh, because worship, some of it, is based on some really old practices. Uh, we use words in worship that we don't necessarily use uh, in the rest of our lives. And so today as we continue our Confirmation 2.0 study, we're going to be asking that question, why do we worship how we do? And kind of doing a flyover of some of our practices. But before we jump into the question of why we worship how we do, it's helpful first to look at our, our Christian understanding of the nature of God, uh, who God is. And as we talked about in the children's sermon, one of the foundational beliefs in Christianity is that we believe in a God of Trinity, right? God who is one God and yet three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the idea of God existing in Trinity is kind of interesting because there is nowhere in the Bible where it says God is a Trinity as, as such. It never says that blatantly. The word Trinity never appears in the Bible. Uh, but what it came from was some interesting narratives in Scripture that kind of implied it without blatantly saying it. So even if you go way back to the first chapter, the first book, Genesis 1, uh, Judaism always had a weird thing because it said we are monotheistic, right? Judaism was one of the few ancient religions that was, uh, said there's only one God in a sea of polytheism of people believing in many gods. That was their big conviction. 
And yet there was always this weird thing where in Genesis 1, when God is talking about let's create, uh, the, the, the language goes like this. God says, let us create in our own image, right? Which is a really weird thing for a religion that believes in one God. Uh, and then later in Christian history, we have the stories of the New Testament, which also kind of describe weird things where there's one God and yet there's different things going on uh, at the same time. So there's, there's lots of examples, but one of those is the baptism of Jesus, where Jesus, who's described as the Son of God, appears to John the Baptist. He becomes baptized, and we hear the voice from the Father in heaven saying, this is my beloved in whom I am well pleased. And then it says, like a dove, uh, the Spirit came and descended on Jesus Christ. And so over a few hundred years in the church history, they always kind of had the sense that that was going on, but they eventually created a term for it, which was Trinity, that again, God is three in one, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity is one of the hardest doctrines to wrap our human brains around. I don't even, you know, it's hard to, how do we think of something that's at the same time one and also three? Uh, But I think the most important thing to talk about is to say that the doctrine of the Trinity teaches that God is fundamentally relationship, that God's very nature, even when God's alone, is to be in relationship, right? So before the creation of the world, before there was anything else, even when God was alone, it's like the children's sermon, there was this flow of love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's what it says in John 1, like for Jesus. Uh, Jesus was born, but the Son existed before time, right? So this flow of love that's happening in the Trinity, uh, God the Father sends out his love to the Son, who then returns it through the Spirit, and there's that flow of love. And what we see is that the whole story of what God is doing is kind of a byproduct of who God is. That God is about relationship, and so everything that God does in creation is also about relationship. Let's make sure we whisper, okay? I'm alone today. And uh, and so uh, God is creating, and everything is about oneness, really. Everything is about creating oneness in creation. And you can see everything else in the Christian story as being part of this mission to bring oneness, right? To bring unity to different things. So like, you know, the cross and Jesus and and worship and, and the church, right? Everything that God's doing is really the bigger picture is bringing oneness to creation because that is what God is all about, bringing love and flow uh, between the creation. So if we then turn back to worship, we can look at the Christian story uh, through the lens of a God who is Trinity, and we can see that also everything in worship is about oneness, right? Why do we worship the way we do? We do because we're trying to live out oneness with God. And, uh, you know, Jesus once said that the greatest two commandments are to love God and one another. So everything in worship is kind of living out that creating oneness between God and one another. And the reason I think God gave us worship is because the fact is, even though we could experience oneness with God in lots of different ways, human beings get distracted. I don't know. I know I get distracted. You know, it's like a, 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 a rabbit jumps by and I'm kind of distracted like you know, a squirrel or whatever. And uh, that's how we are. You know, we get distracted in our lives. And so just like in the beginning of the creation story, God has a day of rest. He gives us this time as a gift to really intentionally focus on God and what it means to be one with God and our neighbor. And so then if we look at the different sections of a worship service, certainly a Lutheran worship service, we can see these different sections of, of oneness that promote oneness. And I'll say at the outset, you know, I'm talking about Lutheran worship. There are other ways to worship. Those ways are okay too, uh, but we'll talk about our own tradition today and, and some of the ways that it promotes oneness. So coming back to the meaning be- behind what we do in worship, uh, when I was in seminary, I was taught kind of a helpful frame of thinking about worship, that in worship there are sort of four basic movements, four basic uh, phases. The first one is the gathering phase. The second one is the word phase. The third one is the meal phase. And the fourth one is the sending phase. So the gathering phase uh, is the one that kind of calls us to attention uh, on who God is and, and, uh, and kind of invites us into that oneness with God. And it kind of helps prepare us for the rest of the service. 
So like a lot of times in a worship service, you'll have an opening prayer. It's sometimes called the invocation prayer, right? Invoke means to name something. And so you're invoking the God that you worship, the kind of God, and we often name the Trinity in that, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we're inviting in a oneness with the particular kind of God we worship. And then we have gathering music. And, you know, I talked about the Reformation earlier about bringing in the common language was one of the reforms. Another reform of the Reformation was to bring worship music into worship. Now, to be fair, there was some music in worship before the Reformation, but it was was largely just liturgical pieces. You know, like they would sing the Psalms a little bit or chant this or that. Uh, But there was very little like hymn singing or song singing. And so one of the big innovations uh, through Luther and other reformers was to write tons of hymns and to try to make worship more joyful and engaging by having more music. And I think it worked, because, I mean, how many people do you talk to who say that music is the most important or one of the most important things uh, in, in, in their connecting with God and worship? So there's music. And then we have the passing of the peace. And we did that, you know, a few minutes ago. And this is one of my favorite wor- practices in worship, um, because if you pay attention to the wording, it's not our peace we pass to each other. Have you ever noticed that? It's the peace of Christ be with you all and also with you. So we're passing Christ's peace to one another. And there's a sense in which it would be good if we're passing our peace too. But even if we're not, it doesn't matter. You know, even if I'm not best friends with you, even if you don't like me, that doesn't matter. You know, we're passing Christ's peace as a way of promoting oneness And even if we have issues, it doesn't matter because this is an example of us getting beyond ourselves, getting beyond our own little pettiness and passing Christ's peace no matter who we're passing it to. So that's a wonderful practice. And then we have, after that, uh, often the confession. Uh, The confession is uh, there because sometimes in order to experience oneness, we have to get some things off our chest. Sometimes guilt plays a role. And so this is a time to let go of anything uh, that stands between us and God so that we can be ready for the next stage. Also, more recently, they also kind of, in the Lutheran tradition, created a thanksgiving for baptism. It's just meant to be a more thankful mode of of opening up. Uh, so, So that's another thing that's sometimes there. So those are all gathering practices, things that kind of invite us into this time of oneness with God. And then we get to the word phase. And the word phase is all about hearing the message of God uh, and and being reminded of who God is uh, through teaching and preaching. So, of course, we usually have some Bible readings. Uh, Different churches have different numbers, uh, but, you know, we do some amount of Bible readings. And then in most services, though actually not today because I just picked ones that talked about worship, but uh, you usually have a gospel reading, and we usually rise for the gospel as a way of acknowledging that the story of Jesus is kind of our principal story for understanding who God is. And then we have a sermon, which is meant to connect uh, who God is and, and, and the teaching with normal life. Sometimes we're more successful than other times, but that's the goal at least. Uh, so we're preaching to try to connect uh, the Bible with life. And then uh, we get to some different practices in worship, which are kind of our response to some of these things. Uh, For instance, we share in the offering, right? So we we acknowledge we've been gifted by God and we we somehow offer our gifts back, whether through financial means or just by offering our hearts and our time to God. Uh, and, uh, And then as Lutherans, we usually share the Apostles' Creed, or sometimes the Nicene Creed. Uh, These are very old statements of faith that were written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And uh, these creeds are meant to kind of collect us into one belief. And, you know, this is an example of how Lutheranism kind of is a middle way between old and new things in worship. Uh, This is an old thing in worship. In Lutheranism, we really like uh, the idea of innovation and reform. That's part of our identity, right? We're a Reformation movement, so it's good to have new songs and and some new practices. But we also want to be tied to our older heritage, uh, to the idea that we're not just an island of spirituality, but we're connected to the long history. And so this this kind of thing of doing like a, a confession, like the Apostles' Creed, ties us to a larger history that goes beyond our own time. And then we move to prayers of the people. And this is a time when we pray together as one church, and not just one church here, but one with the whole church every time in every place. And what this means is that sometimes we pray for individual needs, people in our community or people we know. That's great. That's very important. Other times we pray for big issues, you know, for the creation, for for suffering in the world, whatever it is. The big thing is we never say a prayer that the whole church couldn't say 
faithfully. So it's never, God, give me this promotion and not the other person the promotion. That's, that's not a prayer of the people. That's a prayer of me. It's a prayer of the people that everyone uh, could get on board with. And then this brings us to the next phase. Uh, we've had gathering, we've had word, and then we get to the meal stage of the worship. And uh, if the word stage is about experiencing God with our minds and our understanding, uh, the meal stage is about experiencing God with our senses. You know, literally kind of experiencing God in our bodies through communion, right? Which is kind of the, the, the highlight of that. And so we literally get to taste and smell and see Christ in some mysterious way. Uh, we receive the meal of communion. And in a way, a lot of people feel it's kind of this ultimate experience of oneness with God, which we do not because we came up with it, but because Jesus literally said, do this in remembrance of me, right? So it's a worship practice in terms of tying us to history. It's like the oldest kind of thing, tying us to what Jesus told us to do. And so in this meal, you know, we hear the story every week of how this happened, of, of Jesus' Last Supper. And then we say the Lord's Prayer. We pray the, the prayer that Jesus taught us, uh, taught us, and then we eat God in some mysterious way. We receive God's presence, I guess, because you are what you eat, right? And so uh, we want to become more like Christ, and so God literally gives himself for us to consume. And again, it's a thing where it's all about oneness. Uh, we share in the meal together, whether or not we're best friends. We share in the meal, not just here, but we're sharing in this meal with the whole church of all times, because in Christ we're one. And then we get to the final stage of worship, uh, which is the sending stage. It's the shortest phase of worship because most of it is meant to be lived when you're not here. It's being sent out. It's this realization uh, that, uh, that church is meant to be lived not just when you're in the building of church, but out in the world. And so it usually involves a closing prayer. It, it involves a blessing in God's name, maybe a song, and then go in peace, serve the Lord. So we're actually telling you to leave, leave this place, uh, because hopefully you've been formed in your experience of worship, and then you could live differently in the world. Uh, and so uh, those are kind of the four phases of worship. Uh, I know that's a lot of information. It's a lot of ideas. But the main thing to know is just that it's all about oneness. It's all about God making us more at one with himself and more at one with our neighbor. That is the goal of worship, of everything we're doing. And for some of us, this piece is more meaningful. For another of us, this piece is more meaningful. That's okay. But whatever it is for you, that's the goal of worship. Uh, one of my favorite teachers said that worship is kind of like practicing the kingdom of God. Right? We're practicing what it means to be one here so that we can practice it when we're out there. So that's kind of our answer to why we worship like we do. At least that's a quick overview. Uh, it, in a few weeks after we're done with the series, I'll do a study on kind of a, a brief history of Christian worship that you're welcome to come to. Uh, but I hope you learned a few new things in that. And let's close uh, with a prayer uh, thanking God for, for what he brings us in worship. God of Trinity, God of oneness, you once taught us that the greatest commandments are to love you and to love our neighbor. And then you taught us that you're one with us wherever two or three are gathered in your name. Help us to truly offer ourselves to you in worship, and through worship, bring oneness between us and you and all people in the creation. Amen.